2 Peter 1.5 says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge. Knowledge. You know, there's a saying, those of you who think you know everything are very annoying to those of us who do. Um, you know, knowledge for the sake of knowing can kind of become a religion in and of itself, can it? Do you know people who are fact junkies or seem to have just the most random bits of information? You're kind of like, who asked you? We don't really need to know all those things. Maybe you know people who love to know things that other people don't even think about. There's a magazine. It's online now. You can find it if you have time to waste, because that's about all you would do on this website is waste time. It's called Mental Floss, and it's, it's full of clever, uh, albeit mostly useless, knowledge. Uh, one issue contained a small column on bizarre presidential disabilities. For instance, William Howard Taft had a dented skull. I don't know if that'll be on Jeopardy. Um, but just in case, now you know, William Howard Taft. James Madison had a deep scar on his nose from frostbite. Andrew Jackson apparently had a drooling problem that only got worse when he was angry. Benjamin Harrison wore gloves all the time to hide a terrible rash that he had on his hands. And James Buchanan, he was nearsighted in one eye and farsighted in the other. Now, I suppose that some of this information could be used in a quirky way, but honestly, the material is mostly useless. Have you guys heard of dihydrogen monoxide? Be careful around that stuff. It's been around for a while, but it got a lot of media attention back in 1997 when a high school student by the name of Nathan Zoner, he circulated a petition in his school to ban the substance as part of a high school science fair. According to this student, Zoner, dihydrogen monoxide may cause severe burns, accelerates the corrosion and rusting of many metals, and has been found in the excised tumors of cancer patients. Despite these risks, he further noticed, the nefarious chemical is often used as an industrial solvent and coolant. It's used in the production of styrofoam and as a fire retardant. It's a pretty impressive chemical that we all know as water. While I'm not the most knowledgeable person that I know, I do know stuff. I do. For example, did you know that in the year 1386, the French executed a pig by public hanging for the crime of murder? Yeah, I knew that. <laughs> did you know that a cockroach can live for several weeks with its head cut off? Now you know. Use that information how you will. That's yours. Take it. It's come to my attention that right-handed people live on average nine years longer than left-handed people. Mm. That one, I tell you, eat right, left-handed people. You've got to make up for some time. I don't know. I also know that the elephant is the only mammal that can't jump. Can't jump. They can step up on things, but they can't jump. Did you know that women blink nearly twice as often as men? You guys didn't know you were coming for so much education and elucidation this morning, did you? I tell you, just full of knowledge, I'm going to give it to all of you. There's knowledge, and then there's stuff that people just know. Now, none of the facts that I mentioned earlier are particularly helpful or necessary. Even if we're being totally serious about our knowledge, the, the nature of knowing today is much different from the knowledge that Peter is calling us to add to our faith. The biblical idea for knowledge is a wider sweep than our word to know. It includes perceiving, learning, understanding, willing, performing, and experiencing. To know is not to be intellectually informed about some abstract principle, but to apprehend and to experience 
reality. Knowledge is not the possession of information, but rather its exercise or actualization. So in other words, knowing God is not about knowing about him in some abstract and impersonal manner, but rather it is to enter into his saving actions. I know God because I have experienced his salvation in my life firsthand. To know God is not to struggle philosophically with his eternal essence, but rather to recognize and accept his claims. It's not solely some mystical contemplation, but it includes dutiful obedience. In the doing of justice and righteousness, Josiah is said to have known God. True knowledge of God involves living according to his will, and the opposite of knowledge, according to the scriptures, is not ignorance, but rebellion. Peter continues the list of virtues to which we should give ourselves wholly by adding knowledge to our goodness. Now the word that Peter used is gnosis. Gnosis is practical knowledge. It's the ability to apply insight and experience to a particular situation. It's the knowledge that equips a person to make a good choice and to act honorably. Basically, this kind of knowledge is practical wisdom integrated into real life. One commentator adds this about knowledge. It refers to the ability to handle life successfully. It is the opposite of being so heavenly minded as to be of no earthly good. This kind of knowledge does not come automatically. It comes from obedience to the will of God. In the Christian life, you must not separate the heart and the mind, the character from knowledge. Peter would have seen this knowledge at work firsthand. In Mark 1, Jesus experiences a full Sabbath day. Right? We could say that it was a pretty full day. He goes to church. He casts out a demon between the personal ministries report and the special music. Then he goes to Peter's house and he heals his mother-in-law from the sickness, only to find the entire town waiting at the door for healing as soon as the sun went down. He's had a long day. The Bible says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let's, let's go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Interesting. And you and I in that position, would we have stopped and prayed, or would we have felt that we knew what the mission was? Christ, exhausted by life's demands, finds the clarity and the courage to move on. To know what to do and when to do it, that's the epitome of practical knowledge, isn't it? The disciples and the townspeople, they might have looked at such a decision and come to a different conclusion. But Jesus, in solitude and in prayer, gets clarity about his next step. Paul, having been trained under the finest thinkers, echoes a passion for this practical knowledge. He says in Philippians 1.9, he says, This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So the knowledge spoken of by Peter, prayed for by Paul and modeled by Christ is a useful life-shaping insight into what is practical 
and effective. But remember, Adam and Eve, they fell partly because of their curiosity to know. You see, God created within us, he created us with a capacity and a drive to learn, but even practical knowledge can be used for destructive purposes. Listen to this quote. It says, Adam and Eve were driven from the garden because of the kind of knowledge that they reached for, a knowledge that distrusted and excluded God. Their drive to know aroused not from love, but from curiosity and control, from the desire to possess powers belonging to God alone. They failed to honor the fact that God knew them first, knew them in their limits as well as their potential. In their refusal to know as they were known, they reached for a kind of knowledge that always leads to death. Jesus, he charged the Pharisees with a misguided quest for knowledge, didn't he? He said in John 5, he says, you diligently study the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Here you are, you're looking at the pages, these scrolls, and all they're doing is telling about me. They're telling you I'm going to come, they're telling you I'm the Messiah, they're telling me I'm going to save you. You don't care. You don't care at all. If knowledge becomes the end in and of itself, then it ends in death. But knowledge can be a vehicle to understand and respond to the living Christ. Jesus says this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So, if we are to add to our goodness knowledge, then we must begin with what we're going to choose to be our sources of knowing, right? Some lean completely on their own experiences, right? It's my lived truth. It's my lived experience. I know this. This is what I have experienced. Others know what is true in life because they watch the news 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we all know the media reports nothing but facts and truth. What are you laughing for? We choose from whom or what we get our information. What are your sources of knowledge? The Bible, music, friends, teachers, only what you see, Only what seems to work, movies, Wikipedia, science, charismatic leaders, art, Wikipedia, blog content, the sources are endless. But if we are truly interested in making our way home, we must use our sources of knowledge wisely. Perhaps the first and best source for knowledge is found in the pages of Scripture. It contains many punchy, short statements of wisdom and poignant phrases that attain universal popularity. The golden rule, judge not lest ye be judged, a stitch in time saves nine. Wait, 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 wait. That's not, that saying doesn't grow out of Scripture, sorry about that. And see, that, that illustrates the problem, doesn't it? We get these solid sound bites. I've heard so many times, oh, money is the root of all evil. That's not what the Bible says. For the love of money is the root of all evil. And yet, what a difference it makes. I hear so many things that are attributed to the Bible, and I'm like, that's not in the Bible. But if the Bible is not your source of knowledge, how would we know that? No context, no connection to the grand theme of life, just little snippets, just little sound bites, just little phrases. Even more, the phrases of Scripture, if cut and pasted haphazardly or carelessly, can communicate a message that God never intended to communicate. For example, 
when it comes to situations in life where telling the truth might be costly, I could quote directly from the Bible and say, a lie is an abomination to the Lord, dot, 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 and an ever-present help in times of trouble. That's what the Bible says. But that's way out of context, incorrect, and dubious theology at best. Anything can pass for knowledge if we cut and paste and take out of context. The Bible is much more than a book of catchy phrases and and heart-stabbing insights. And we know this, but my fear is that today we're more familiar with the Bible than we are fed by the Bible. I read a story about a pastor. He was braver than me because I didn't do this. But what he did was he glued a, an old leather Bible cover over a, a, a cheap uh, used romance novel that he had found. Okay, and so he, he brought it up front. He was speaking to a youth group, and, and, and he pulled open his pseudo-Bible, and he began just kind of tearing pages out and waddling them up and throwing them to the ground. And boy, let me tell you, I can only imagine the young people gasping, the parents glaring and standing up, looking around for someone to remove this heretical pastor. The pastor quickly held up his hand and said, please, please know that I would never mistreat a Bible. This book is fake. It's, it's not a real Bible at all. The crowd looked relieved, but they were still uncertain as to what his point was. The pastor then asked the questions, why, why did you react the way I did when I tore the pages from this book? Well, because it's God's word. Well, because it's a holy book. Well, I agree, says the pastor. The Bible is God's word, and it is, without a doubt in my mind, holy. But let me ask you, what is worse? Tearing Bible pages out of disrespect or completely ignoring it, knowing full well that it's God's message to you. So which is more vile? Hatred or indifference? Disdain or disregard? Disrespect or disinterest? The ultimate lesson for me is that I have so much more knowledge about knowledge than I know what to do with. It's easy to take God's word for granted. Maybe it's time to embrace the knowledge of Scripture with a little bit more commitment and determination. Practicing the discipline of being informed and guided by God's word doesn't make you perfect, but it does deepen your understanding of his will for your life. The practice of searching the scriptures to find knowledge is often fruitless, if not boring. Again, the type of of knowledge that Peter is referring to is an active, practical application of information. Below are, 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 here are some, some choice sentiments on gaining knowledge through God's revealed word. Ellen White captures the simplicity and depth the discipline that adds knowledge to goodness. Here's here's what she says. There is nothing, nothing, there is nothing more calculated to strengthen the intellect than the study of the scriptures. No other book is so potent to elevate the thoughts, to give vigor to the faculties, as the broad, ennobling truths of the Bible. If God's word were studied as it should be, men would have a breadth of mind, a nobility of character, and a stability of purpose rarely seen in these times. But there is but little benefit derived from a hasty reading of the scriptures. One may read the whole Bible through and yet fail to see its beauty or comprehend its deep and hidden meaning. Okay, okay, pastor, so how do we do it? 
You know, it's likely that most people don't neglect Bible study because they don't believe it as much as they avoid it because they don't know how or where to start. As you consider various methods of Bible study, you'll notice that most devotional approaches are quite similar. You might start with one of the Gospels. You might start with one of the letters to the churches in the New Testament, or even even the Old Testament narratives are a rich place to start and begin. But what you need is a method that you continue to practice so that your eyes and mind can become more effective at seeing the knowledge that's right in front of your eyes. Here's a process that's helpful to me. Step number one, look at God's word. Okay, What you're reading, simply read it carefully. With eyes that are open, observe the details of the text. The words, the phrases, the names, the emotions, what's going on. You might try underlining, circling, highlighting specific things that you notice that stick with you. With eyes that imagine, picture the reality, the event, the conversation. With eyes that focus, dwell on one idea, one thought, or one section at a time. Step two, listen to God's word. Try to hear the message that God is saying to you in the passage. This is the living word, all right? This book still speaks today with ears to their world back in that day. Listen so you can understand what the writer meant to say in his time and place. And then with the ears of today's world, listen so you can sense the relevance of the message that God is wanting to speak to you today. With ears that recognize the sound of God's voice speaking to your heart and life, listen personally. Step three, learn from God's word. Connect the message to the reality of your life, your experience, your history with a balanced mind to measure each each passage in the light of the whole of Scripture, with a practical mind to determine areas of your life that that might need renewal and, and how that might occur, with a proactive mind that seeks to to live differently in the light of those discoveries. Then step four, live God's Word. Deliberately practice in a tangible way what you have discovered with personal application that directly relates to your scenario and your sphere of influence. With a a pliable heart, a willing heart that is, that is able to be shaped by your study throughout the day. I am not perfect, you are not perfect, that's not news to anyone. So when you're reading your Bible, understand there might be something I need to change in my life. I might need to actually apply some of these principles to how I'm living my life. God is speaking directly to us through his word every day. If you will open it and read it, he has a message for you. That is the promise of God, not me. We need to have a specific response when we come to that conclusion. You can say, I want to control my temper. But a more tangible, practical application would be, you know what? I'm going to go play basketball tonight. I'm going to control my temper during the basketball game. The more specific the plan, the greater your chances are to remember to apply it. Again, the work of learning how to do this is not magical, it's not electric, it's not addictive. It takes a commitment. It takes a determination to become a student of the Scripture. Some might wonder how solitude fosters knowledge. But remember, earlier we referred to that busy day in Mark where Jesus rose early in the morning to be alone and pray. The solitude offered him the time and the stillness to gain some clarity about his mission. In our world, time 
and being still are both at a premium, aren't they? When you aren't used to being alone with God, you never feel at home in your own brain. Solitude creates space for God to get into you and for you to get into God. Our frenzied lifestyles, our constant camaraderie make us crazy, make us afraid of being alone and quiet. Like rats on speed, there seems to be a collective cultural influence on our lives that is powerful. What is missing? The individual, the self. People who are okay with being alone because they are not defined by culture but by the living Christ. Look at Jesus dismissing the crowd, moving into the quietness of the mountains and being found alone again. Jesus isn't shy, nor is he sick of the ministry. He enters into moments of solitude to be mindful of who he is and what God's mission for him is. Ellen White urges believers to experience the possibilities of a reflective life when she says, as we thus contemplate heavenly themes, our faith and love will grow stronger and our prayers will be more and more acceptable to God because they will be more and more mixed with faith and love. There will be more constant confidence in Jesus and a daily living experience in his power to save to the uttermost all that come unto God by him. Those who practice reflective moments of solitude seem to have a strength of character that stands composed when the crowds are unraveling. Daniel, David, Esther, Elijah, Moses, John the Baptist, Jesus of Nazareth, Joseph. They all had to stop, think, reflect, and wonder in order to be the heroes that they were in public. What did they know in the quiet place that enabled them to stand in the roar of trial? Give deliberate stillness a try and let your knowledge of God and his plan for you deepen. The quest for knowledge runs deep in our human makeup so much so that we often misuse this gift of knowledge and and center our learning around ourselves. But looking at Christ, his word, and the reality of life, we see with unmistakable clarity the purpose that our ability to know anything is for knowing our Creator. That's why He gives us this curiosity, this thirst for knowledge, because He wants us to learn more about Him. So many times Peter thought he knew. He knew what it meant for Christ to be the Messiah. He knew how many times to forgive. He he knew how Christ should talk, and he knew what his own heart would do under pressure. But as Peter learned about living holy for the Savior, he discovered that knowing Christ leads to a transformed life. And that's my prayer for all of us. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask that you transform us by our knowledge of you. Help us to learn of you daily. Help us to seek you diligently, Lord. You've said that if we seek you, we will find you when we search with all of our hearts. And so, Lord, help us to put all our heart and soul into finding and knowing you. You have said that we need to add to our goodness knowledge. And so, Lord, we just ask for you to bless us with the knowledge that we need to have. Not trivial, ineffective knowledge. Not knowledge for the sake of knowing. But a true, real-life, practical knowledge of you and your work in our lives. Lord, we love you. 
We thank you for all that you do and that you continue to do for us. In your name we pray, amen.